cacao in Pingalap. Like alcohol, it is forbidden by the Congregationalist Church, but in Pompeii, the drinking of cacao, once reserved for only those of royal blood, has now become virtually universal. Indeed, I wondered whether it was partly responsible for the lethargic pace of life here. The Catholic Church, more accommodating than the Congregationalist, accepts it as a legitimate form of sacrament. We had seen cacao bars in town and thatched open-air bars all over the countryside, circular or semicircular, with a great medate or grinding stone, which the Pompeians call a petal, in the center, and we remained eager to try some ourselves. We had been invited by a local physician and colleague of Greg's, May Okahiro, to experience a traditional Sakao ceremony that evening. It was a cloudless evening, and we got to our house at sunset and settled into chairs on our deck, overlooking the Pacific. Three Bonpi and me men, wiry and muscular, arrived, carrying a pepper roots and a sheaf of slimy inner bark from a hibiscus plant. A large petal awaited them in the courtyard. They chopped the roots into little and then started pounding those with heavy stones in an intricate, syncopated rhythm like the one we heard across the water on our return from Nan Madal. A sound at once attention-holding and hypnotic because, like a river, it was both monotonous and ever-changing. Then one man got up, went to get fresh water, and poured this in, a little at a time, to the wet, pulpy mass in the metate while his companions continued their complex, iridescent rhythm. The roots were all macerated now, their lacetones emulsified. The pulp was placed on the sinewy, glistening hibiscus bark, which was twisted around, which was twisted around it to form a long, closely wound roll. The roll was wrung tighter and tighter, the cacao extruded, vicious, reluctant at its margins. This liquid was collected carefully in a coconut shell, and I was offered the first cup. Its appearance was nauseating, gray, slimy, turbid, but thinking of its spiritual effects, I emptied the cup. It went down easily, like an oyster, numbing my lips slightly as it did so. More cacao was squeezed out of the hibiscus sheath, and a second cup of fluid obtained. It was offered to Newt, who took it in the proper way, hands crossed, palms up, and then quaffed it down. The cup, emptied and refilled half a dozen times, went to each person according to a strict order of precedence. By the time it came back to me, the cacao was thinner. I was not wholly sorry, for a sense of such ease, such relaxation had come on me, that I felt I could not stand, that I had to sink into a chair. Similar symptoms seemed to have seized my companions, but such effects were expected, and there were chairs for us all. The evening star was high above the horizon, brilliant against the near-violet backdrop of the night. Newt, next to me, was looking upward as well, and pointed out the pole star, Vega, Arcturus overhead. These are the stars the Polynesians used, said Bob, when they sailed in their proas across the firmament of space. A sense of their voyages, five thousand years of voyaging, rose up like a vision as he talked. I felt a sense of their history, all history, converging on us now, as we sat facing the ocean under the night sky. Bonpei itself felt like a ship. May's house looked like a giant lantern and the rocky prominence we were on, like the brow of the ship. What good chaps they are, I thought, eyeing the others. God's in heaven, and all's well with the world. Startled at this unctuous, mellifluous flow of thought, so far from my usual anxious, querulous frame of mind, I realized my face was set in a mild, vapid smile, and I looked at my companions, I could see the same smile at them too. Only then did I realize that we were all stoned, but sweetly, mildly, so that one felt, so to speak, more nearly oneself. I gazed at the sky once again, and suddenly a strange refer reversal or illusion occurred, so that instead of seeing the stars in the sky, I saw the sky, the night sky, hanging on the stars, and I felt I was actually seeing Joyce's vision of the heaven tree of stars, hung with humid and night blue fruit. 
was normal again. Something on or odd was going on in my visual cortex, I decided. A perceptual shift, a reversal of foreground and background, or was this a shift at a higher level, a conceptual or metaphoric one? Now the sky seemed full of shooting stars. This, I assumed, was an effervescence in my cortex, and then Bob said, look, shooting stars. Reality, metaphor, illusion, hallucination, seemed to be dissolving, merging into one another. I tried to get up, but found I could not. There had been a gradually deepening numbness in my body, starting as a tingling num and numbness in my mouth and lips, and now I no longer knew where my limbs were, or how I could get them to move. After a momentary alarm, I yielded to the feeling, a feeling which, uncomprehended, was frightening, uncontrolled, but which now accepted, was delicious, floating, levitation. Excellent, I thought, the neurologist in me aroused. I have read this, and now I'm experiencing it. Lack of light touch, lack of per perception, this must be what de-affrontation feels like. My companions, I saw, were all lying motionless in their chairs, levitating too, or perhaps asleep. All of us, indeed, slept deeply and dreamlessly that night, and the next morning awoke crystal clear, refreshed, clear at least, cognitively and emotionally. Though my eyes were still playing tricks, lingering effects, I presumed of the cacao. I got up early and recorded these in my notebook. Floating over coral heads, lips of giant clams, preser preservating, filling the whole visual field, suddenly a blue haze, luminous blobs fall from it. I hear the falling blobs distinctly, amplifying. They fill my auditory sensorium. I realize it is how my heart beats, transformed that I am hearing. There is a certain motor and graphic facilitation, preservation too, extracting myself from the sea bottom. The clam lips, the blue falling blobs, I continue writing. Words speak themselves aloud in my mind, not my usual writing. shouting 